Okay, without further ado, the reason why we have Peter here today is because Peter has a new book up and coming. Is that true, Peter? Uh, yes, up and coming. Uh, hopefully, I can launch it later this year. I might speed it up, the schedule, mm-hmm. because uh, the progress has been good. So I might launch earlier than I originally scheduled. So it's a good progress on my side. So I'm here to share about the book today, even though it's uh, not mm-hmm. 100% completed yet. I've been following your post. It seems that uh, you are already now in chapter number six or seven. How many chapters are there, Peter? Um, at this moment, I am thinking about seven. I might add a little bit, but that also depends on my writing. Hmm. And uh, it's been smooth. Although the thinking process is quite different from um, writing just one article. Because if you just write one single article, it's very easy. You just need to have one focus point. You come up with the contents. It's not that much amount of work for one single article. But if you come up like, let's say, a book, it's a totally different thinking process. Okay, just for the benefit for of our viewers, right? Can you share with us what book you are actually writing? Right. The current yeah. book, it's actually my own uh, my own first book. It's uh, intended for those people that just started to learn about public speaking because I've been going through several um, ideas and concept because I wa- I wanted to write start writing my books my own books but I'm not sure what to write about so that thinking came to me of uh, why don't I just go back to where I originally begin so that brings me to the topic of hey why don't I share my experience how did I begin learning about public speaking back then and because the learning process for every single person is very unique, very different. So I feel that there's a value for me to share my own um, experience in learning public speaking, particularly as as for me as an introvert. And how did I go through that process? Hopefully that provides a very useful tips for those that wanted to learn. Yes, that would be great. In fact, this is a book for beginners, right? Public speaking for beginners. Exactly. Be- mm-hmm. and so we have to be honest, there's already a lot mm-hmm. of books for public speaking out there. A lot. If you go to Amazon, if you go to other bookstores, mm-hmm. there's already a lot. So yeah, but- just to follow up on what you are saying, right? There are so many books out there on communication, on public speaking. So mm. where, where would your book be, be placed among the many? Where, where do you think it will be different? That's a very good mm. question. And I assume mm. I will be asked that question a lot when I go <laughs> on tour and try to promote my book. Yes. So what's, where do I position myself would be my... Because I've been trying to, before writing this book, I have been Mm -hmm. uh, coaching people here and there, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. within the context of Toastmasters. I've been uh, coaching up and coming new members. Oh, how do you start learning about public speaking? What do you need to pay attention on? This and that, the whole thing. I know, I kind of know how to do the coaching process already. But I haven't really like mm-hmm. compiled it, the whole hands-on experience. So in this sense, it's more like a compilation or reflection of my own hands-on experience rather than just theory alone. You can, you can always come up with a lot of uh, theory about communication, public speaking. Mm-hmm. But if, for my case, if 
I come from a very hands-on uh, approach. So that makes it, if I turn it into a book, that would make it really easy for the audience to uh, pick it up and start learning because it's from experience. It's not just theory. So it's actually a practical, battle-tested ideas. Yes. Trial and tested <laughs> because for me, when I when I uh, start, when I coach <laughs> people, when I share with others, I always make sure that I don't go too jargon-ish. You know, a lot of theory mm -hmm. here and there. I would go straight to the person that wants to learn public speaking and I give actual tips that they can actually put to use instead of theories. Oh, just, you know, do better this and that. Uh, don't stand like this. Don't stand like this. The conventional yes. way might be that, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what kind of angle you need to stand. Mm -hmm. uh, where should you look? You imagine the crowd as <laughs> you imagine the crowd as uh, cabbages. There's actually a theory yes. of that. Yes, yes. Just I look at, about that as well. Think of it. Your <laughs> audience is just a field of cabbages, and don't don't respond to them. Just don't look at them, and then you won't feel nervous. For both of us, we, we, we all know it doesn't really work. Yes. <laughs> so I always make sure I, that I go mm -hmm. around carefully, that I don't give tips or, or sharing that is not really mm -hmm. applicable. I make sure every single advice and tips is something that they can put into use. Very true, very true. And for those that are, that are joining us, there are a lot of... Uh, fancy theories out there, but most importantly is if you can find something that is genuine, that is tested, like what Peter tried to, to share in his book, that will be something you want to look out for. For those who are watching, if you have any comments, if you have any comments that you want to, uh, you want Peter to actually address, right, on public speaking, on communication, do feel free to comment below so that Peter knows. Face okay. live or in actual situation, it happens. Yes, yes, as always. Okay, uh, let us go on, right? So, what yes. we have uh, talked about so far is uh, your new book, Why Is It Different? And uh, some of the fancy theories out there versus battle tested practical ideas, right? On how to actually speak in public. So, the next question that we have is. A lot of people have this idea that I'm not going to be a speaker. Why mm -hmm. public speaking is relevant for me? Oh, that question. I'm so familiar yes. with the question. <laughs> As I, I got asked every time, why, why do I need that? Yeah. Cause I'm not a DJ. I'm not a celebrity. Yes. This and that. Why? What does it have to do with me? That's a very legit question, actually. So, as we can all see now, even even the the prime even the prime minister shared about a few days ago. He shared about digital economy, people going online to sell their stuff, to sell their kueh, to sell their handmade products, this and that going. And one of the main way they 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 trying to engage with their potential customers is that they would go live and they would talk just like us talk to the camera mm -hmm. and trying to convince the potential customers to buy their products so that they could make some income from that and even in this situation that we're not mm -hmm. going live when and that we're not facing real faces it's still a kind of process of communication. Mm -hmm. So it requires very uh, long time of consistent training so that you are constantly, you know the tempo, the structure of what, what should go first, the points that you should say, 
or when something goes wrong, like what happened just now, the technical glitches, yes. what do we, how do we respond? Do we stay calm or do we just freak out and run around? Mm -hmm. You need training. You cannot run mm -hmm. away from that. So even during um, Zoom meetings for companies, employees of companies and people doing business, it still requires you to have good communication skills, public speaking. You're speaking to other people. There's difference, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I have friends that tell me, oh, I can really speak well when I'm with my friends and family. I'm immensely funny. I, I sound very wise. But when I talk to strangers, when I, for example, for example, I go live with my colleagues talking to my customers, I suddenly just, you know, chicken out and I don't know what to say. That tells you the importance of learning public speaking. And I'm sure that when we go back to normal again after MCO, oh, now it's called CMCO, is it? There's a new name for that. We have to get used to that as well. And when we go back to normal again, real life situation, it also going to take us uh, extensive communication skills. How do we present our ideas with, to our bosses? How do we discuss um, our thoughts with our colleagues? How do we follow up with the work? So why is it relevant? That's a good question. As you can, as you can uh, see in the examples I given just now, it's in your everyday life, whether it's work, whether it's um, communicating with your spouse. It would save you a lot of time if you could uh, make sure that the communication process is smooth and people actually get what you say. Instead of you having trying to concentrate yourself. So everyone can learn that and everyone needs to learn public speaking. If we want to put it I think the message for our audience is public speaking is actually applicable in many places and, and in many ways. Even even when today you are pitching your product or services on uh, Instagram Live or whether you are presenting in front of uh, a board meeting, all these are uh, methods and uh, you can say all these are different ways where public speaking can be applied which leads, leads us to this key point that you just mentioned, right, Peter? You mentioned that public speaking actually requires training. Yes. And both of us have never really met in real life. But uh, from what I see, many years back, when you are starting out your public speaking journey, it seems to be a very transform transformational journey for yourself as well. Can you oh, yeah. take us back 10 years? Can you take us back 10 years ago? Who is Peter? And right. what, what uh, do you learn? How do you start? Oh, wow, 10 years. Okay, I'm 30 this year. So 10 years ago, that would make me 20. Uh, when I was 20, I was, I, was still, I was still in college. And back then I was actually quite depressed. I'm trying to figure out life. I was uh, very lost. I don't know where to go. What do I do with my life? And this and that. So together with uh, the lack of training of communication from school, you don't really get to practice that even in college. <laughs> the students would just, classmates would just push to each other to stand in front of a class and do presentation. That is one of the scariest things for people to to do in when you're in college. It's very scary because you don't know what to do, don't know what to say. And uh, your, 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 your classmates would judge you, laugh at you. 
<laughs> that happens when you're college kids. So I experienced the same thing. But back then, I, I did try here and there, even presentations in front of class. It's not that I was afraid or anything, but I don't know how to do it. I would go, I would go in front of people and and say things, trying to, trying to be good in presentation, but I found that it's always uh, there is always hiccups. I would miss things here and there. I would have hiccups. I would be panicking. So that lasted for many years, since you know, like you said, ten years ago. Even until I was uh, 24, 25. So that lasted, actually lasted for years. It doesn't, because if you don't learn how to overcome it, it's, it's just, the problem will just stick with you. And that actually affects the progress of my career. Because I couldn't communicate myself well. And sometimes when you have miscommunications, you don't feel like you enjoy your job. And that would eventually lead to career progress that is not so smooth. Mm -hmm. So that was what I experienced in my early 20s. Where is the turning point? Is there a specific circumstance that uh, forced you to break out of the shell that make you realize this is the skill I need to pick up? Yeah, good question. Um, I, the turning point starts around four years ago. So that was like when I was 26, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. When I start joining um, Toastmasters, because it, the problem has gone uh, so bad because I, I, I realize it's, it's not going anywhere if I don't have good communication skills. So... And then I was trying to figure out where my career path would be down the road. Mm -hmm. So I, I make the effort. I go on the internet because I've heard of uh, Toastmasters before. I go on the internet. I search where's the nearest club to me. And I go and visit. And I found that I like the atmosphere. So I stuck with the club since then until now. And that was a very pivotal point for me. Uh, the reason why I said so is communication is just not not a one-way road. Despite uh, you know either just one person speaking and the other listening, it's a two-way road. You have to convey message, and at the same time, you have to receive message. So that trains me how to listen effectively for for beginning. And that also builds me the positive mindset of <clears throat> as long as you're willing to put in the effort, as long as you want to, you can continue to grow. You can actually set goals for yourself and you can achieve it, which at the end of the journey of reaching the goal, you become a better person. So the past four years has been transformative for me as a person. I remember reading one of your posts regarding, I think it's Toastmasters Bigfoot. Is that your club? Oh, yes, that's my home club, so to speak. That's where I, I affiliate, affiliate with that club. So I started that's the with, club uh, that you are with for years. Yeah, I stuck with the club. Mm -hmm. um, I started as a normal member, and when I was asked to take on roles, you know, leadership roles with the clubs, I helped to take care of uh, mm -hmm. public relations, memberships, education. You know, I take care of it, 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 the education part. We have several roles in a club. <clears throat> we call it the 
exco members when you have several roles. You you know, like I said, uh, education, public relations, so on and so forth. I go then eventually I progress to become a club president. And currently I'm managing five clubs, which um, sums up to about 50, 60 people. Yeah, so imagine the progress I've been through for the past four years. From someone that is just trying to solve my own problem, and at this stage I'm managing about 50 plus people, leading them, growing together with them. So that's a big leap for me. Very true, very true. And to top it off, according to your post at least, you say that uh, public speaking has actually, at first, by not being good at communication, it actually puts like a limiter to your career and your relationships. How have your career and relationships actually grow after you master public speaking or becoming more competent in it? Yes, the benefits from it is that I become more proactive because, um, when I'm not good in speaking out my mind, I would tend to always, you know, you, you would encounter stumbling rocks, stumbling blocks, and you don't know how to communicate with people. And in a way, you don't know how, I don't know how to communicate with myself. And that frustrates me at the earlier stage. So now that I learn how to communicate, wow with people and with myself, I realize that I need to first put the need of other people in consideration if I want something in, in them, you know, as, in free, as a freelancer, let's say, mm -hmm. if I want the job, I should consider what is the need of my clients? How do I fulfill the need of my client? Then that makes it easier for me to let's say, get selected for the project. So that's the transformation I've been through. And in fact, um, I've been through partnerships before and that was the real test. That, that was within like the four year frame that I was with Toastmasters. So when I was learning about public speaking and communication, at the same time, I'm also learning about how do I communicate with my partners? I can tell you if you're in the partnership business with another, other people, it's not going to be easy. You will be constantly arguing, constantly trying to agree on something, exchanging um, ideas. So that gives me the tools that I can use when I'm trying to get works done, when I'm trying to talk to client. If I haven't been through that process of uh, training of public speaking and, and communication, I can imagine that it would be harder for me. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging and I would get constantly frustrated if I haven't been through that training. Wonderful, Sherry. So let us take a break and have a look at uh, the comments that we receive. Oh, okay. Yep. You can pin up the comments if uh, if if that's possible yeah. on our yeah. stream here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Because we are starting our wash party at other places as well, so we are keeping track of that. Okay. Before we start uh, attending to the comment sections, mm -hmm. let us play a game, right? I'm going to state a statement, at least the uh, public perception regarding public speaking and mm -hmm. you make your commentary on it, whether it's true or false. 
Oh wow. Okay. Okay. Like the myth of public speaking. <laughs> yeah, the myth of public speaking, right? So right, the uh, belief number one is introverts cannot be public speaker. What say you? Oh, do I have to provide commentary after I say? It? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You may. You may. Uh, the question was, introverts, can they be good with public speaking or not? Introverts cannot be public speakers. What do you think? Uh, short answer, no. Long answer, uh, the reason why I said so is, even when you research about the great leaders throughout the history, Many of them are actually quite introverted. And introverted meaning they reflect a lot. They go inside a lot to think about what they can learn from the people they see or to think of the situation. And just that introverts need more time to process or they, they have to use much more capacity inside their head because they are processing thoughts at the same time, they're listening to the audience at the same time, and they have to output their thoughts into words, into delivery of speeches. So the answer is no. Uh, introverts can still be good speakers provided they are given the proper training or they've been through the proper training. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So the second one, you have to memorize the entire scripts to excel in public speaking. Oh yes, that's another, another thing I always see when I'm coaching people to, to do public speaking. Mm -hmm. if, in fact, I've even seen a, uh, 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 students of mine getting very frustrated with themselves. They said, oh, I, I forgot mm. that particular line. You know, I didn't mm. deliver every single word of my speech. And I was like, don't do that. It's not the proper way. Because what happens when you're too focused on just spitting out, regurgitating every word, word by word, what happened is that you're stuck in your own head with your own lines and you forgot about the audience, which is the reason why we're doing public speaking. So, hmm. uh, no, you should not memorize the whole speech. You should focus on what the core message I want my audience to get at the end of my speech or do I simply want them to be entertained that's okay as well or do I want to convince them for a cause then only I, we reverse engineer our whole speech instead of just memorizing words that's not gonna work very true very true it almost make you nervous if you try to memorize the whole script word by word. I mean I have a little I have a little secret yeah. for myself. Yeah. Every single speech that I deliver and prepare, mm. I always forget something. You know, <laughs> I I would have let's say ten points. Mm. I might drop the ball for two or three because I was too excited. I was too engaged with the crowd. Let, guess what the audience would say? They say, "Oh, you, you're very uh, engaging. It's very fun." Mm -hmm. I told them, "You do not know what I forgot to say just now." But hey, glad you enjoyed. It. Cheers. <laughs> true, true. I, I think at the end of the day, sometimes you've got to let go of some of the details that you overlook, and uh, focus on the big picture, right? Which is actually engaging the audience and make sure you're able to convey your message. Exactly, that's correct. Talking about anxiety. Statement number three. 
experienced speakers no longer have anxiety on stage. Wrong. What do you think? It's, that's not true. Um, that, let's put it this way. There's reason why we feel anxious. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, deep inside our head, some part of our brain, I biologically, I forgot what's that called. It's like a size of a peanut. It's uh, in charge of your fight or flee response. What do you call that again? I don't know. So that part of our ancestors, they still left it in our head. Mm -hmm. Whenever we, we, are, we, we have to dealt with crisis, something that might endanger us. In fact, public speaking is categorized as the number one fear for for most people compared to death. Death is second. Public speaking is number one. Mm. So that tells you a lot. So anxiety, that happens. And the reason why we happen, according to my interpretation, is that we care about what's going on. What's going to go on next? Whether when we got on the stage or when we stand in front of a crowd, how the crowd would respond. How the crowd would perceive. So, anxiety is always good. Provided you utilize it well. You have to tell yourself when you're giving public speaking. Yet the reason why I'm feeling anxious is that I care. I am concerned about the audience that I'm, that I'm dealing with. I want them to have a good experience, good message. I want them to be entertained. And when you have that kind of positive mindset, it's not brainwashing yourself, but to think to interpret the situation where you get the best out of it. <laughs> That's how I see anxiety. I still have an anxiety. Every live, even live streams, even when I'm standing in front of uh, a big crowd, that doesn't really, I don't let st that stop me from having a good time. So, all in all, it depends on how you deal with it. Anxiety, it's definitely going to be there, you like it or not, but how do you respond to it? How do you deal with it? It's the critical difference. Very true. I think this is one of the uh, bigger myths regarding uh, public speaking. People always believe that uh, anyone who is good at it actually do not have any anxiety or fears when they are on stage. But uh, being human, everyone felt anxiety, fear, concern to a certain degree. And most of the best speakers actually have uh, certain rituals where they, uh, how to say, immerse themselves in, in order to get into the zone. Do you have a certain ritual before you, you get on stage to say? Oh yeah, I like that question. Mm -hmm. I, if I'm not mistaken, um, mm -hmm. the famous motivator or an author, Tony Robbins, actually had a ritual of himself. He would be jumping uh, behind the stage, you know, jumping up and down, not mm -hmm. a, a, around, but just to get you know the blood flow going, get himself hyped up. He mm -hmm. would recite a few words that reinforces positive thinking, then only he would storm on the stage and start delivering his speech. For me, it's not so much that because I'm not so much of an mm. extrovert person. I, it's hard for me to get that level of uh, excitement. Mm. I, I'm always like um, low and calm kind of person the, that's my default setting so how I do it is 
I would always make a point to be at the venue early. If I'm hosting an event, you know, I would go there early, would walk around the vicinity, I would observe the venue, would talk to the rate to the sound system guy. Okay, hey, how's the setting today? Everything cool? What do I need to pay attention? You know? And then the event manager, okay, what's the flow for today? Step one, two, three, and ten. And I go on the stage and I test my these are my own ritual instead of uh, other kind of uh, ways. There are which, whichever way that works with you, go ahead and do it. No, but for me, it's always like that. Get familiar with the surrounding. Try and then when my uh, preparation is done, I would just find a spot at the backstage. You know, have some warm water. Just calm down and not really think about anything then yeah we go on stage that's that's my approach I, th I think that is a legit approach as well because of familiarizing with your environment and uh, getting prepared reaching there early all these things actually reduce your anxiety level because uh, at, at one point, your, your mind believed that you are prepared, you're well versed with the environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, all, all these things, right? I mean, like, if you're not familiar with the environment, this is for our reptilian brain, right? That is like the uh, number one danger, right? I don't know where am I at, right? And if you, are, if you arrive late and things like that, it is uh, like a telltale sign that uh, I, I don't know what to expect. It is as if our reptilian brain has this idea that uh, if the more certain I am, the more safe I feel I am. Yes, your reptilian so is brain the, uh, yeah. will get panic <laughs> and tell you to just run away from the venue. And another thing I would do <laughs> is that I would try to get a feeling of what kind of crowd am, am I expecting today? Am I going to a very serious event? Mm -hmm. uh, everything goes goes to procedure one, two, three, four, five. Then I will make sure that I get very formal, professional, and all that. But if the crowd that I'm with today is looking, expecting to have fun, expecting to have a good time, then. I would switch myself to another mode where I get excited together with them. I'm going to make sure everyone that attended the event is totally hyped up, everyone have a good time, and I provided good service for my clients. Whether they want to sell something or they want to build relationship with their customers. So, gauging who's the kind of audience that we is also another key point. It's not about it's not about you. It's about who you are. You are entertaining. That's how I put it. Yes, I agree. I think there there need to be a shift of focus uh, from ourselves to the uh, people that we are actually supposed to speak to, supposed to engage, supposed to entertain. You know, there are so much focus on uh, what we are, you know, but uh, too little focus on what is the uh, demographics of the uh, audience that we are speaking to, how are they seated, uh, why do they come here for, right? What is the purpose they are here for? Who are the VIPs? Correct. So I, I think that there is a so so much more, right? People are so much into their own hate, like what is happening to me, what I need to prepare, but they have not thought about everything else, the the yeah. environment, the people they are speaking to, what is the agenda. So to be a good speaker is not so much just about your own personal psychology or how you stand and things like that, but ultimately you have to take into the consideration of all the other external factors as well. Exactly, that's that can't be more true. It's not 
about us as, as the speaker or host, I would say 50%, like we're the one delivering the content and all that, but the focus is on our audience. How do we serve them better? You have to be paranoid about it. How do we provide the best ever possible experience during this, let's say, one day event or two, three hours? How do we give the best to them and have a good time? So you shouldn't be concerning that, oh, how many people would be judging me, this and that. If you have time for that, you will have time for the audience, which is not fair for them. Yeah, you need to have that kind of attitude. Yes, that's very true. Uh, for, for the benefit of our audience, right, it's easier for people to understand if there is an uh, example that you can share. Most of the fear of uh, public speakers of people who wants to speak on stage or on live, their, their fear is, what if I say something wrong or do something wrong, right? How do I cover that up? So our question for you would be, do you have a personal experience or you have seen some of your colleagues that uh, speak on stage and there is a slip up, there is a error in whatever message they are conveying? How do they adapt to the situation? Oh yeah, I like that question. Brings back memory. <laughs> I think one of the, from my experience as an MC, one of the things that happens quite often is the some other MC would, or some people would forgot to address the title of people, you know, let's say that was that three times three, this and that, their position with the company, mm. the sequence, who should go on stage first, who should stand where, you know, this director might hate that dato, so you have to separate them apart so that they don't try to strangle each other, things like that happen. And or, or the, the the sequence or a moment where uh, you don't follow the flow of the show, you have the van, and you don't follow the, you know, you need to have okay up next we have this guest to be on the stage, and then your your event assistant tell you oh it's a he or she is still in the washroom, and you're like what do I do now? Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. So that that happens all the time, and that is part of the process if you're doing public speaking, whether for professionally or you are just uh, in a smaller setting. That happens, and I assume that our audience will want to know how I respond to that. Let me give you a very. Uh, mm -hmm. Case study, personal experience, yes. total catastrophe. I'm sure the audience would love it. So, um, a few years back, I actually volunteered to host an indie concert right by the sea here in Penang. It's beautiful, it's right by the seaside, it's Sunshine Beach and all that, you know, barbecue, all that good stuff. What happened is um, the performers were late. You know, thirty minutes after the scheduled time for the concert to start, our technical crews are still, you know, testing one, two, testing one, two, mm -hmm. <laughs> tuning all the settings mm -hmm. and all that. I was like, "What is everyone doing?" Mm -hmm. And What's even more fun, uh, the performers were late and those that are supposed to perform first, that arrive super late, one, two hour after the whole show begin, it's like a whole evening of performance, so you can imagine, it's 
like a marathon of indie musicians and that those that supposed to perform later they arrive they arrive on time I don't know why I mean I appreciate that but those that supposed to go on stage first they arrive late so I spend a good old 30 minutes after the show began to panic and how I respond to that was hmm I told myself I need to calm down. I, everyone is running like headless chicken. It's, it cannot stay on like this. So what I did was I go through my list of performers. Like, cool. Um, whoever's here, please go and uh, tell the sound system guy what kind of settings you want. You know, let's get through this. Those that have less setting. If you have only one guitar or one guitar, one drum, you, you guys, you go on stage now, you start entertaining your crowd. The others, you immediately tell the sound guy what you want. Get on the show. Give everyone a good time. And uh, lo and behold, the audience was very chill. Everyone was cool about it. I guess the food play a critical part to keep them entertained. <laughs> so everyone enjoy the, 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 the food while we are trying to save the fire on the stage. And luckily we try to, we managed to bring back the show. Everyone had a good time, you know, and go back happily. And that's a good outcome that we all want if something goes wrong. But imagine if you have the negative mindset what if you start panicking and you don't try to resolve the situation and you just panic around with everyone else? What would happen is the show would crash, no one would have a good time, you would be upset with yourself for years. That's not what we want, but critical moment is when that kind of situation happens. How do we respond to that? So that's, that makes all the difference. And that requires long-term consistent training. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that is a fantastic example, right? The, instead of uh, we always talk about what, what happens when things goes right, people are really interested in what to do when things goes wrong, you know? Once again, people want to cover their base first. Uh, I think another another cool situation that we can talk about is, uh, I'm sure in your career as a speaker, as an MC, there are times where you need to uh, speak with someone else, right? You actually have a partner, whether it's one more partner or two or three more partners, right? That you oh, have yeah. to uh, host an event together. What, what are the um, common do and don'ts in your experience? Oh, I like that question. Because <laughs> when you have co-hosts, especially on the actual live event, mm -hmm. you have a million things that could happen. Uh, do's and don'ts. Okay. Mm. Uh, first, we start with the don't. The what? The first thing that we need to keep in mind is we need to communicate with our co-hosts first. You know, what's your expectation for the event? What do you want, um, you know, in, in your mind, what is considered good experience? Try to synchronize expectation. How can we together bring good experience to our audience? And what's your style? Are you like kind of serious person? You know, you can know that through conversation. Are you like serious person or do you want to do it? Do you want to do it casually? You need to have that before you can go on stage and have a good time. So first thing, uh, don't skip the process of communicating with your co-host. You know, then that makes the do part is to 
respect your co-host. You actually listen to your co-host and trying to figure out what's actually good. How can how can we together collaborate? And um, another thing that I would always emphasize is you have to gauge the tempo of your co-host. Despite what they tell you, what they want for the event, they would have habits, their own mm. inbuilt tempo. So from time to time, it's like uh, dancing. I don't dance at all, but I can see if you're dancing with another person. If bo both of the dancers are not synchronizing, what would happen? is that they would keep stepping on the foot of each other. They would, they would just knock into each other and it's not going to be a good dance. So when you're co-hosting with other person, it's doubled the difficulty. Because other than dealing with the audience, you also have to deal with your co-hosts. How do we work together? Very true. I mean, when, when you actually have a, a partner or co-host, sometimes more than one, you know, when you need, need to work with other people, it's a, it's a whole different experience because it's not just, again, it's not just you and the audience. You actually have a partner that you have to consider. So again, a very interesting situation for those who wants to uh, learn how to speak in public. If for our audience who are watching this, if you have uh, li been listening, to uh, Peter's uh, sharing here and then, right? You will realize that there are actually many angles and many contacts of uh, public speaking. Sometimes it's the different audience that you're facing, right? Whether it's a small group, big group, sometimes it's a different environment. There are also many different types of uh, public speaking, like, like the modules that you have in your Toastmasters, right? Humorous speaking and all, all the different types of speaking. So there are different types of public speaking. There are different audience that you are speaking to. And there are also different purpose of public speaking. There are also different circumstances where you speak alone or there is actually co-hosting. So a lot of this is, is why public speaking is something that if you have a mentor or someone that you can practice with, uh, that someone that can coach you, or someone that you can actually refer to if you have any queries that will actually helps you a lot. So let's go back to your book, right? For those who are watching this. So uh, with us today is actually MC Peter uh, with his new upcoming book. For now, the tentative title is actually Public Speaking for Beginners, where uh, Peter will be sharing his uh, real life experience, right? Where he is going to break it down into uh, probably seven chapters on uh, things he has experienced himself, he know what works and what doesn't. Okay, to, to go on with it, right, we we have explored a bit about the uh, different circumstances, mystics in public speaking, myth of public speaking. So there's an uh, area where, how will communication change with all this uh, new technology, right? How will public speaking being applied in this new age of Zoom and the lights? Oh yeah, great question. Um, the we have to say the existing way of public speaking training up until now is still offline, face to face, person to person. So it's actually a brand new landscape, you know, new landscape for everyone where we have to deal with. That's that's something, the context that we need to begin with. And despite uh, many of us still not being able to meet face to face, we have technologies mm -hmm. to assist us, all these tools. And what can we uh, do to properly deal with it? Is first, you need to have a very open minded attitude towards all these new tools. You know, be proactive, learn how it works, learn the differences between all the tools so that you can communicate well. So it's 
now we have to agree that the capability to utilize all this uh, technological tools for communications is now becoming part of the public speaking tools, the skill set that you need to learn. So you need to constantly be learning how does it really work? You know, how do I, how do I do, how do I use the settings of Zooms? How do I use, uh, you know, let's say in our case, StreamYard, how do I do StreamYard properly? How do I share slideshows, you know, visuals? When we are having meeting with other person, you have to, even for us, I assume, when all these tools are available, mm -hmm. we have to go back to zero and be humble, learn how all these tools works and utilize it so that you can address your audience well. Instead of uh, get, having all these new things to stop you, you should, you should use that to your own benefit. Yes, Peter. So for all the uh, new technologies uh, that, that we have, so your, your message basically is uh, we must learn it, must adapt to it, we must uh, master it. Because at the end of the day, another aspect of communication is actually the tools, the medium that we use to communicate. So we, we have gone actually quite a range from uh, simply overcoming some anxiety issues to different conditions, circumstances, partners, and now we have, we have reached the idea of uh, different mediums of communication. There are, there are a lot of uh, angles, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things that we actually need to learn and to get trained in. Now, let us go back a bit to your book, right? So what can someone expect from your book? Which of these many areas which, uh, that you will focus on? Um. Good question. What would they get is like what I mentioned in in the very beginning of this interview. I'll bring back them to the foundations of what is actually public speaking. You know, have a proper understanding of what this craft is actually about. What the mindset that you need to have, because. Sometimes it can be overwhelming learning this totally new skills, especially when it's mm -hmm. so complicated, so complex. You're not just dealing with yourself. If you're learning some other skills, you can probably master it and then you'll be good at it. But what's tricky about public speaking is you can only be good with it the more you interact with people or the more that you go live on Facebook and other platforms. So that makes it tricky. And I want to help the future readers, potential customers of my book that have proper acknowledgement that everyone can be a good communicator. You don't have to necessarily be like Tony Robbins, super good, shining on the stage, touching 50,000 people's heart. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't really have to. But mm. if you want to, you can go through the learning process one step at a time, gradually become better. That's always the spirit that I advocate, which I will include in my book. As long as you want to, as long as you're willing to put in the effort, as long as you're willing to work on it consistently, every single one of you, even if you know nothing, if you just begin learning how to speak to people effectively, you can also be good with it. And I, my book will provide them with good understanding, you know, good mindset, good attitude that you need to have the foundation part so that they can utilize on that new skill that they acquire and be successful 
in their personal life and of course their career. Talking about your book, are we expecting a ebook or are we expecting a print? And um, uh, where do you plan to publish this? I plan to do ebook first, and then okay. I after ebook I will make it into uh, audio book because um, audio book is getting more more and more popularity. Everyone listens to audiobook and podcast nowadays, so I want to reach those kind of people as well. You know, you can drive to work every day or go back, mm -hmm. then you listen to the audiobook, then you become, then you picked up the skills. So these are the process that I will been through or the end goal. And of course, when you talk about ebook, you cannot avoid launching your ebook on Amazon. That's the de facto option, and I will see if I have other options to to sell my book, to share my book. Very well, very well. So we are looking at the uh, second half of the year for your Amazon ebook. Yes. Uh, after finish writing, the next thing I'll need to learn is learning how to launch a book on Amazon. So you see, even for myself, I don't wait until I'm 100% know how to do everything, then I only I take action. I learn as I go. If I don't know, I always have my friend Google with me, which will try to find me the, 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 situ, the, the knowledge, the skills that I need. Then I put that into trial and error. Then I learn how to do it. So. Life is always fun for me because I know no matter what are the setbacks is, I'm always in the positive cycle. Okay, what do I learn next? What do I need to know next? What can I learn from this person, that person? If you have, if you fill up your, your life with that, see, it's just, it's, it's not just public speaking. You can utilize the attitude, the positive attitude that you get from learning how to be good public speaker, that you further you utilize that into your other aspect of your life, which will benefit you becoming a more wholesome person. Very true. The, uh, the go-getter attitude, the uh, learning by doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, starting before you are 100% ready. All these are very good uh, habits to have because uh, what stops people from doing many things, including public speaking, is the fear of uh, looking silly, of, is the fear of uncertainty. But to get started in anything in life is to face uncertainties, is to do it despite the fear. And that, that's the only way that you can grow. And for anyone who have experienced that before, like Peter, I'm sure you know the uh, transformational value of it. Life is just so so much different if you just uh, press ahead. Yeah, and times pass very fast. And you look back and you're glad that you make that decision to learn public speaking. You make that decision to actually study the book. You make that decision to actually research when you don't know something, to build a network. So all these are actually great decisions that you don't have to hesitate or think twice. Okay, we shall, I think we have been uh, speaking for the past uh, and uh, close, I think probably like an hour. So to oh, wrap this up, Peter. <laughs> yes. To wrap this up, what is your final message to our audience who is watching this? Okay, final audience, uh, final message to my audience, uh, do pay uh, close attention to progress of my book and from time to time I would share tips on how to become a you know tips for public speaking how do you improve your communication skills this and that and final message that I would like to everyone to take home or take back is 
like I said just now, if you want to, you can you can become a better communicator. You can become a public better public speaker. Do it one step at a time. Do it gradually. And when you encounter a stumble block, when you have setbacks, interpret it positively. Everything is a learning process. Life is more fun and wholesome if you're constantly learning and progressing compared to staying static. That's what I want the audience to remember. Very, very true and very apt ending for our interview today. Once again, I'm C. Peter. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we look forward to uh, reading your book on the second half of year 2020. Sure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. See you.